All right, so we're going to get in and, and do part two of our vision. And so um, I'll go get right into it. Oh, let me go back. Uh-oh. All right, so I'll read this. Rede- Redeemer Church is an intentionally multi-ethnic community of Christians committed to glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ and proclaiming the good news of his kingdom, both in word and deed, to the Broadmoor, Broad Meadow neighborhoods, the city of Jackson, and to the world. So that might be something that we'll quit you on. Uh, no, I'm just playing. But it is helpful to know. And did Brian walk through that, that vision statement with you guys? Okay, so I don't need to do that. Great. Oh, there it is right there. All right. So uh, the multi-ethnic church. And I, I pray that um, this vision isn't our own. It's not like we have a patent on this whole idea of being a multi-ethnic church. We think it flows straight from some principles in God's word. First thing we we read in Genesis, um, that all people have a common origin in the creation of the universe by God. Um, And you see that. I mean, several places where, you know, all man and woman come from one man and one woman, and it's Adam and Eve. And and that's crucial that we're not sort of different breeds. We're not different, you know, different people like uh, on one level we are one we come from the same mother and father uh, of, of the world and so i think that's acts he made from one blood the whole human race to dwell on the entire surface of the earth and he fixed the ordered seasons and boundaries of the regions so that people might seek god even grope for him and find him though indeed he is not far from us and so that's the apostle paul preaching that that from one blood the entire human race dwells even on the surface of the earth you see this also in the table of nations where where in genesis it's just listing nation after nation after nation after nation you look at god's covenant um promise to abraham that he was not just to be a blessing to israel which i think was assumed but when paul starts to apply the gospel and, and look at it through the lens of abraham it says through him the nations with an S would be blessed. And so God's heart was never exclusively and solely for Israel. That it was for the world. It was for the nations. That there are commandments even concerning the strangers in Israel. A stranger, an outsider of Israel could become as a Jew. I mean, they could actually come into the fold of God's people. And you see that in, in Numbers and Deuteronomy. And Isaiah says the nations are within the sphere of God's activity. Um, Even the temple, when when Jesus goes in and he's upset at what the temple had become, this place where it's separatistic, this place where business transactions are being, uh, are are happening, he's angry because his father's house should be a house of prayer for all nations. And even in the construction of the temple, there was a court of the Gentiles. I mean, there was a place earmarked for Gentiles who wanted to come in, and, and, and what they had done was they had turned that part of the temple into a place where they did their trading. And that's what angered Jesus, that you have taken the one space in the temple where Gentiles can come in, and you've turned this space into business transactions, which implies that there is no room for Gentiles because you're doing this right here where they, they're supposed to be gathering. God is king of all the earth. At Pentecost, uh, Acts chapter 2, Babel is essentially undone, and each person heard the disciples speaking in his own language. And so if you know Genesis, you know the, uh, the Tower of Babel where the commandment was to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth. In other words, start here in Eden and go out and work. Rule the earth, subdue it. Make this garden, this picture, this place where God has set apart for you expand that that was the cultural mandate go out and be faithful and spread and 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 rule over the earth well in Babel, they decided not to go out they decided not to spread out they decided to come to a city as themselves and build a temple or a tower whose heights were reaching to the heavens and it was god who intervened and it was god who confused language so that right then we believe that the different languages that we see Uh, that we presently have right now, they're coming from Babel. It was God who actually had to confuse language 
to force men and women to spread out and to not use language as this instrument to be rebellious. And so from there, the scriptures say that the people spread across the, the earth. I mean, that, that's in, in God's word. And so what we believe is happening in Pentecost, it's, it's an undoing of Babel. That when all the people gather in Jerusalem for Pentecost, that the disciples are preaching and teaching, but the people, the nations who would have, the, the Jews who would have been in exile and who would have gone into other countries would have come home for that ceremony. And they would have been hearing the gospel being proclaimed in their own language. And from there, the gospel gets to go out. The Parthians and the Scythians, and all, I mean, they just go back to those areas where they're from, but they have the gospel in their vernacular. And so God cares not just about what's happening in Jerusalem. He is sending the gospel out to the ends of the earth. The book of Ephesians is God has destroyed the dividing wall of hostility between the Jew and the Greek, and he, he now makes them one in Christ. He makes them one in Christ. And so, the church as the body of Christ, the physical presence of Jesus in the world. And so, that's what we mean when we say that this whole idea of being a multi-ethnic, cross-cultural church, this is not something that we think is unique. We think it is the outworking of the gospel. We think it, it is in step with the gospel. It is in step with the saving work of Christ, where black and white and rich and poor, that we can come together as brothers and sisters in the Lord. So Redeemer didn't make this up. So I want to give some definitions of a multi-ethnic church, and I'll, I'll work with this. Uh, Paul Hebert. He's a late missiologist of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He says this, a multi-ethnic church is a church where there is first an attitude and second a practice of accepting people of all ethnic, class, and national origins as equal and fully participating members and ministries in the fellowship of the church. It's not letting me go. Let me see if I can do it this way. It's, fro it's frozen right now. All right, it'll, hopefully it'll unfreeze here shortly. So notice what he says. It's, it's an attitude first. It's a commitment. It's a heart posture. It is being convinced by the Spirit that this is a work of the Spirit. And then it shows itself up in practice. In other words, we want this, but then how do we pursue this, practically speaking, so that all people, regardless of ethnicity or class or nationality, might be full participating members in the life of this church and then secondly, he would say that it's a manifestation. So attitude, practice, those go together, but also a manifestation or a visible demonstration of this attitude and practice by the actual involvement. And so it's not enough to dream it and to want it, but to press into it and to see it become a reality. And by God's grace, that's what we've seen at Redeemer. We have seen God be faithful. We have seen God be faithful to his own mission and to the work of this church because we think that we are in alignment with his will. Roger Greenway. Oh, man. Hey, Steve, can you come here for one second? It's like frozen. It won't let me go to the next one. You got the little pinwheel going? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what to do with it. Let me see if I can. Oh, we didn't do it. So what we're going to have to do is uh, we got to it. Oh, wow. Okay. Anybody know how to work Macs? How do you get to the place where you can see all your open apps and then do an, uh, you know, I got it on my computer. Ah, okay. Yeah, we got to force quit it, I think. And then just reopen it. Yeah. Yep, that's it right there. He's a surgeon. You want to see what's that? Let's see if it works. And now we should be able to reopen it. Shouldn't it rekey it? Maybe. All right. Thank you, brother. Yeah, okay. Appreciate it. Boom. Are we there? 
All right, where's slideshow? <laughs> right there. All right, how do I share the presenter notes? I don't use PowerPoint. I use Keynote. So I'm, I'm out of my element right now. There it is. Perfect. I'm going to screen that up a little bit. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Steve. Okay, here we go. Roger Greenway, a multi-ethnic church blends distinctive elements of various ethnic traditions in such a way that no single tradition predominates or suppresses the other. Um, Brian Loritz, uh, who was at Fellowship Memphis uh, for several years, um, he's written a book where he sort of defines a multi-ethnic church as a church where uh, no race, no particular race is over 80% of the makeup of the congregation. So he sort of uses that as a metric. He thinks that a tipping point sort of happens once you sort of get the 80-20, that you get more of the subdominant culture, having a voice in the life of the church. They shape the vision of the church. They're participating in the life of the church. And so he would uh, make the case that he would agree with all of this, but he he's looking at that 28 year rule, that something magical happens once you sort of hit the 20% mark. So this is some of the definitions. What I want to do now is look at some of the characteristics. And so, um, and I love these kind of charts. And so there are three types of multi-ethnic church. One is an assimilated multi-ethnic congregation. And that is typically when a subdominant culture or people group uh, are coming into a dominant culture. And the way that they engage the space is by becoming like. And so, and, and, and it may not be vocal or it may not be verbal or expressed, but the way you exist as a minority in dominant space is by taking on the cultural practices and norms and worldviews of said culture. And so uh, I, I think for me, just I learned this when I was in, in the corporate world. Like there's a way that I speak and talk and dress sort of when I'm with black people or hanging around or I grew up, but then you sort of go into the culprit world. You have to code switch, right? You have to use correct English. You have to dress a certain way that, in other words, for me to exist in this space as a minority in a, in a culture and in a field that's dominated by white men, then I have to sort of throw off certain things. And so that's why you'll see guys who wear dreads. They'll wear dreads all through college, but they know that when I want to get a job, then I need to sort of rid myself of all of these things because I, there is some assimilation that's happening. Now, I'm not saying assimilation is wrong. I think it's a function. I think we learn to coexist. But I think in the church, we have to be careful that we don't make the church culture, that we're not sort of making people become like us, sing like us, sing these songs and like these same songs. We have to be careful to preserve diversity within unity. But you can have multi-ethnic churches, but the, the unspoken rule is that you have to sort of become like us. We can't disagree. We can't, we, you know, th does that make sense? That's a way to do it. I think the pluralistic multi-ethnic congregation, contain, uh, and, and that's pluralistic in the sense that let's get a lot of different people under the same, uh, I guess, in the same fellowship, and let's not pursue unity Let's celebrate our individual diversity, and let's hold on to that. In other words, there's no striving towards unity under the banner of Christ. Rather, we celebrate diversity. So one is saying, become like us. One is saying, no, stay exactly like you are, and then we'll celebrate. And then the third option is to be integrated, where you're free to put on and put off. You're free to be who you are. You're free to stand up and say amen if you want to. And you're free to sit down and not stand up and say amen. That there's a freedom because we're submitting to the unity of the whole. And so that's sort of what you see here is that um, an organizational culture reflects one dominant culture. Look at the, the next one. Contains separate and distinct elements of all racial cultures. The third is, I think, is ideal. 
maintains aspects of separate cultures and also creates a new culture from the cultures in the congregation. That's the ideal, that we want to preserve diversity, but we also want to strive for unity and strive to have our, our culture shaped and who we are changed in light of the whole. And so what you typically see in an in assimilated multi-ethnic congregation, one dominant race is in leadership, one dominant race is making decisions about the life and future and vision of the church. Uh, and you might, but in the, the other two, that you will usually get representatives of different races in the congregation. So they'd be in agreement there. And then the degree of social interaction across the races. In assimilated churches, it can be high or low, but in a pluralistic church, it's usually low. And I think you see this, uh, and I am all for English for second languages. Like, I am for that. But I think one of the ways that we can see this usually flushing itself out is when you have a separate service that's only Hispanic speaking. And then, you know, we meet at 11 o'clock. Well, this service, can they can use our building at 2 o'clock, and there's no interaction, there's no integration. We're two functioning congregations meeting in the same building, except there's no social interaction across. And so I think the goal is to have high social interaction with people who are sitting at the table with African Americans and white families and poor families and single mothers, that our goal is to not just be here under one building, but still living separate lives. Our goal is to be here in one fellowship and then pressing deeper into our love and knowledge of one another. And so I think some of the healthiest things that you can do as members is to pursue the other. Um, we're having families over for dinner today right now, and my wife and I have strategically, we're making sure that our table is diverse. We want to practice this, not just talk about it. Um, we value it. I mean, we want our children to be that multi-ethnic friendships. I mean, we want that. Um, any questions there? Any comments? All right. So how do we do this? I think first things is keep the gospel first. Um, and what do we mean by that? I think on one level, um, when we say keep the gospel first, we're getting to the heart of what's driving this. That it's not a social experiment. It's not to be cool. This is really the outworking of the gospel. We want to sort of see uh, what the new heavens and the new earth will be like. We can get a foretaste of that right here, right now. When Jesus taught the disciples to pray, it's thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so that's the longing of our prayers is that what's happening in heaven and what is real in heaven becomes more real in our lives right now. And so we believe that Jesus unites all of us to himself. We believe that the common problem of humanity is not race and it's not culture, it's not class, it's sin. That we believe that we are all alienated from our Father and we are saved by grace through the one man, the man Christ Jesus. And so he is our peace. And so just remembering that, that when you look at someone who might be physically different, that when you pull back those things that make us different, that we really are the same in a lot of areas. And so keeping the gospel first, I think, Establishing a clear vision and communicating that over and over and over again just because you don't want the vision to be hijacked. And so we'll talk about it. We'll celebrate it. You'll get a foretaste of it in worship. Um, I think just being really clear. I think another way that we can protect this is to know our community and our city, which is one of the things that's been freeing for us as a church. I mean, I think we know right now that we're on a major thoroughfare in this city that back here is predominantly African-American, over here is predominantly white. That if you go cross over State Street, it's predominantly black. Cross over Ridgewood Road, it's predominantly white. Like, we're kind of right here in the middle of diversity. Class diversity, racial diversity, political diversity. We're right here in the middle. And so I think staying on top of our community and staying focused right here, like our goal is to be faithful right where we are and to pray and to long for us to uh, engage the community in the city that we're in. I think one of the, the other thing is to um, be intentional. 
that intentionality. I mean, it, it's key. And it, 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 one of the definitions of a multi-ethnic church is not just a desire, but it's also the intentionality, the, the active roles that we take at protecting this vision and promoting this vision. And I think it trickles down into the life of the church. It trickles down into, um, I, I can think of a few, our mom study. At one point, our mom study was only during the day. And it was only during the 11 to 1 o'clock hour. And that might not seem problematic unless you sort of come out of a culture like we do where, um, and, and I don't want to, and this isn't the norm, but and, and, our, and our family, when, when black women work, right, like it, it, it just takes a while to sort of get to this place where, what, what do you mean stay at home? What do you mean like not go to work? Like, no, my mother worked and my grandmother worked and my great-grandmother worked. And so when the church is only having mom's Bible studies during the day from 11 to 1, that culturally what's happening is we're isolating working mothers. And it, it's real subtle, and you, you don't sort of know until you get working mothers who say, wait a minute, I work, I can't, I can't do this. And then the church sort of listens. Okay, well, we'll do it Monday night, and we'll do it Tuesday morning. But that's birthed out of just something as simple as for one segment of, of, of our women, no, this is a no-brainer. For another segment of our women, wait a minute, what do you mean? And so the church, sort of, we're, we're learning as we engage that I think we all have cultural blinders. And so that, that's what I think it means to uh, be intentional. That if we want to see this happen, then creating those spaces where um, we can be sensitive and create avenues where everyone can be present. Contextualizing worship, uh, which is, you know, if you've noticed that at Redeemer, you, you really don't know what you're going to get week to week. I mean, I think we've done a really good job, and I say we as in, I'm, I'm only seven months in, but there's sort of, I mean, every week we sort of know, first week it's going to be communion. Second week, it's not going to be communion. Third week's going to be baptism. But even down to what's happening week in and week out, we sort of know that, hey, we're going to do this and do this and do this. And the choir, I mean, we're meeting, okay, what, what black hymn or black song, something that's rich, that honors the African-American tradition, all right, it needs to be here. There have been times when we put services together where it's leaned one way or the other too heavily, and we're going back to the drawing board. I mean, it's, it's, it's intentionality down to what we're singing and the databases that we're keeping and how often we're doing certain songs. I think just being contextually aware uh, is, is a part of protecting this vision. But the, the next thing is uh, diversity in our leadership. And uh, that, that, again, that goes sort of back to some of the models for multi-ethnic ministry. But if you sort of really want to uh, engage the other, then I think it's fair to say that the other needs to be able to look up in leadership and see representation. And so um, we love it that with our deacons, our elders, uh, our staff, we're diverse. And that, that, I think that's been really intentional. We want to embody what we want our people to be starting from leaders. And so it's been one of God's greatest blessings to give us African-American men who will lead and who will serve. And it's been great to watch. And I, I'm in session meetings, and I watch how this stuff gets argued out and prayed out, and that in that session, no one is compromising who they are. We all bring our real selves to bear upon the leadership of the church, and I think the church is more beautiful because of that. Uh, and so I think the Lord has been really kind to, uh, to bring diversity within our leaders. And so if you're here, we don't want you to be on the sidelines. Get engaged, get involved, use your gifts. Our church uh, it's better when there is diversity here, diversity of gifts, but one aim, one goal. Uh, purposeful ministries. And so if you've ever been here on a Wednesday night, I had, a, I had one of my friends here Wednesday night for the first time a few weeks ago, and he was just like, man, I have never seen anything like this in my life. I mean, there were so many kids here. I mean, from our neighborhood, our covenant kids, I mean, it just blew his mind that this type of activity is happening in the life of the church 
uh, whether it's restoring homes, that there is a, a deliberate or a purposeful ministry here where we want to be faithful to our neighborhood and faithful to our covenant children. There's intentionality and, and purpose there. And I, we've talked about deliberate interactions. Uh, talked about that some. So, this is some research that Mike did his entire D men on. And uh, so I've tried to sort of work through it. But it, it's, it's a Greek word, adiaphora. And so uh, a lot of his research were, was built around this. And so that at the core, there are some essentials. And for, for Redeemer, our essentials are standards of orthodoxy. We're, we're a confessional, well, con- Constitution and Confession come out next. But I think right there in the middle would be Scripture and Bible. Like right now, making sure that we're preaching the Scriptures, that we're exalting Jesus that we are at our core, we, we understand the fundamentals of orthodoxy. What, is it, what does the Bible say about me? What does it say about Jesus? What does it say about the Father? Like holding all of that together there. And, and from there, we go out to our constitution or our confessions. And those are some things that we, we want to hold to, but we will not make those secondary things the main things. They're important, and they guide and shape the church, uh, but the main things are in the middle. And then you go one layer out, and and that's adiaphora, or the indifferent things. These are things, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of some categories. So in the middle would be, is the word of God true, or is Jesus really the son of God? You go one step out, and our constitution would be our church government. It would be the confessional standards. And so just, just so you know that for a person to serve as an elder or a deacon, we have to agree on the first and second level. For a person to serve as an officer in the church, we have to be in agreement right there, number one and number two. Now, when you get to the indifferent things, like, man, how do you educate your school? Are you homeschool, private school, public school? We're not going to be a church that says, I mean, we're not going to be a pro-homeschool church or a pro-public school church. We think that's an indifferent thing that we don't need to argue over, that, that you as Christians, you have freedom as you're led by God's Spirit to do what's best for you and to do what's best for your family. Some of you want to live in Jackson. Praise God. But some of you don't want to move. For other reasons, you've decided to live elsewhere. We are not going to be the church to say that, hey, if you live out there, you're selling out. We're not going to be the church to say you have to live right here. No, we think that there's freedom and liberty in those things. Does that make sense? And so I think it's helpful because it allows us to keep the main thing the main thing. It allows us to focus on this neighborhood, this community. It allows us to preach and teach God's word. It li- allows us to be governed by our standards and our confe- confessions. But it actually gives you freedom, freedom to make decisions uh, as the Holy Spirit leads you. And so in RUF, we sort of had this image called the rocket. And you might know the rocket, right? But there's this rocket, right? And you have scripture and God's word and scripture and justification and sanctification and you have this rocket, and right at the top, the goal is to keep the rocket straight. Now, there's, there are ways you can get off. You can get off. If you want to turn your ministry into, uh, what are some of the things? Do you remember some of those things that if we're not careful, we can get off of course? I think theonomy was one, and homeschooling, and um, courtship. I mean, I think, but as we're building a ministry, let's make sure we're keeping the main thing the main thing. Let's stay on course. Scripture justification, sanctification, glorification. And we think there's freedom in other areas. We won't become a Republican church. We won't become a Democratic church. That will fall under indifferent. Not not that we're indifferent, but we're not trying to force this into the main thing. When we say, if you vote this way, you're not a Christian. You will never hear that here. Ever. Right? Ever. Ever. So it's not an essential thing that we're going to be committed to. Hmm. That's good. You want to give a few examples? Yes. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, that's good. That's good. And it could be, I mean, just how you respond in worship. Um, do you want to stand up and say amen? Man, do it. Lift your hands unto the Lord. If you want to sit and be quiet and do it, I think we get into trouble when we start to make some of those peripheral things the main things. Oh, that's not a black church. They don't. It, it's dead. They don't get up. Well, you can stand up. You can say amen. Nobody is stopping you. Don't, do not let what people are not doing stop you from doing what you feel led to do. It's an issue of indifference. You're free to sit and you're free to get up. You're free to say amen and you're free to take it all in cognitively. Like, it's, it's, you were free. And so I think we usually get into trouble when we sort of pull those, those uh, indifferent things into the middle. And we start to make these things uh, mandatory or a requirement or the main thing. It's not, and we want to sort of protect that here. All right. So, uh, one of the things that we are, uh, we do embrace here is uh, reformed, contextualized worship. And so, I talked about this a little bit uh, in the sermon this morning about the regulative principle. So, I'm not talking, I'm not talking out both sides of my mouth here. And I, I had no idea until two nights ago that, that we'd actually be talking about it. But the regulative principle says that um, it, it it says that the Bible must determine the way that we worship the Lord. In other words, we don't have the freedom to introduce certain elements in worship that are not commanded and clearly laid out in Scripture. And so if you notice our liturgy, it, 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 it's, it's usually fixed. I mean, there's going to be a call to worship. It's going to be a Scripture reading. There's usually going to be a confession of sin and a prayer, um, and there's, there's going to be hymns and spiritual songs that we're singing. This is all in accordance with Scripture. There's going to be a, a pastoral prayer every week where our elders get to pray and intercede for God's people. There's going to be the reading of Scripture. There's going to be the preaching of God's Word. There's going to be a benediction that we think that those things are clearly communicated in Scripture as forming um, the biblical Part or uh, elements of worship. So here's some part uh, positives. It can guard the integrity of worship. Now notice it can. It does not, it, it can, and I think that's so important to hear that, that it can guard the integrity of worship. It can keep worship biblical. It can keep worship Christ-centered. It can produce worship that is acceptable to God. Uh, but here's some potential negatives, and this is you, you may get this if you're not from the PCA and you're coming into the life of our church. You may have, uh, you know, the, the, the challenge is to decide what the Bible says. That's from William Edgar. And so uh, just how do we settle down and say that this is uh, commendable in Scripture? So I've heard it both ways. I've heard uh, guys who allow dancing in the church. They'll, they'll allow miming and they'll allow dance as an acceptable form of worship. And the case that they sort of make is, well, David danced. And David danced out of his clothing, right? And, 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 and they're going right to Scripture. And they're saying, wait, why can't we have mime? Why can't we have dance? Well, then you get another guy who says, well, wait a minute. David was not in corporate worship. David was dancing outside, you know, and it wasn't... You, and so you get this argument kind of going back and forth where is it acceptable, is it not acceptable? The Bible shows that he danced, and you got people saying, no, it's a part of it. You have other people saying, hey, this didn't happen in the context of public worship. And so you, does, does that make sense? How do you choose what's acceptable and what's not? So that, that can make it sort of difficult. It can deny cultural influence in worship. And I'll go back to the Amazing Grace. If you remember uh, two weeks ago when Ochon played Amazing Grace, were y'all here then? Raise your hand if you were here two weeks ago. All right. So that if you sort of come out of a tradition that Amazing Grace has to be played a certain way or there has to be this instrumentation to make worship acceptable, 
then you might come into Redeemer and that might seem borderline blasphemous, right? But I love what Brian Taylor did. Did y'all, did y'all catch what Brian did as soon as he got up? He says, this, my friend, will probably qualify as making a joyful noise with the stringed instrument. And so right then, I thought he was being really wise. And in case you were an outsider thinking, like, wait a minute, he just sounded like B.B. King up there. But there was something beautiful there, that the lyrics were there. And when Bryant got up, I mean, he took it straight back to Scripture. That is a joyful noise expressed through an Asian brother playing a guitar like he needs to be in the Delta, right? It's acceptable. Um, and so that's where the regulative principle, it can be used like a pit bull to sort of shut down any other cultural expressions in the life of the church. Does that make sense? All right. All right, and it can be used to justify a certain style, culture, or preference. Um, I remember when we, Redeemer was first started, I mean, we... The pipe organ, you remember that? I mean, there was a big pipe organ right there where the cross is. The big pipe organ was like right there in the back. And I, I will never forget uh, just the conflict surrounding the pipe organ. And it, long story short, Alice Lust stood up in the middle of a prayer meeting. And I, I remember it like it was yesterday. She said, hey, if they want to take the pipe organ, they can have the pipe organ. The Lord will give us what he needs. And so it was beautiful. Like right after that, the pipe organ was ripped out. And, and man, someone, they got a Hammond, Hammond organ and sort of rebuilt this whole thing from the ground up. And it was beautiful. It was beautiful. To, and, and I think more was happening there. It wasn't about the pipe organ. I think it was about, man, if we're going to be a multi-ethnic church, we're going to have to die to it. And it's okay if the Lord takes it away. And so as that white woman who'd been at Trinity all her life, who loves the pipe organ, when she stood up and prayed right then and said, hey, they can take it, I think it was a death. It was a dying to what she loved and had known and had respected for the sake of uh, new instrumentation. It was beautiful. I, 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 was, I cried that night when we were over there. And so there's some helpful distinctions. You can have elements versus circumstances. And so when we say elements of worship, we're talking about the Lord's Supper. We're talking about confession of sin. We're talking about pastoral, pastoral prayer, the reading of Scripture. These are elements. But circumstances are those aspects of public worship that reflect the culture in which the worship takes place. And so at Redeemer, we want to have the elements of biblical worship. But we also want freedom to be there for the spirit to move or for you and your own preferences to have freedom to worship the Lord in a way that is honoring. And so we should look first to the Bible, but also realize that the cultural context of our community and the historic tradition of our church will shape our worship. Okay, so uh, this guy, John Middleton. He makes some helpful distinctions. What does it mean to work at reformed, contextualized worship? The inclusion of various styles of music, inclusion of various instrumentation, more freedom in worship, and everything must be done in decent and in order. 